good afternoon again. I still see that there's uh, some brave people left to, uh, <laughs> to follow uh, this uh, afternoon part uh, of, of the conference. I was told to keep an eye on the clock very specifically until four because we all have to go to hotels and houses to dress up for the uh, official event this evening, so I will uh, do this. Um, I will talk now about uh, another project that I developed and actually is uh, uh, going on in uh, Thomas More University College called uh, Practice Enterprise. It's um, another of um, yeah, what I call the, one of the paradigms of uh, higher education that in my opinion uh, need to be changed, uh, where Campus Fridays as an alternative concept of curriculum was one, and where practice enterprise uh, has to do with the pedagogical and didactical working methods that we use. Um, in the, color, the text in the colors, it's, it's in Dutch, and it's uh, the title of uh, the book I wrote about uh, practice enterprise, and the title means uh, theoretically practice offers the best learning. Um, well, this is a little bit the same slide as this morning, except for the sentence uh, on the bottom, um, where I told this morning that uh, in my own professional career I did some self-navigation to find what uh, actually uh, passionates me. Um, and indeed, uh, being trained as an architect and then starting to do uh, lecturing and research on innovation, um, becoming an educator in entrepreneurship and vice versa and the entrep entrepreneurship education architect. Indeed, I went from practice to theory to practice again uh, throughout those years. And where did I do this? Um, I have to tell a little facts about uh, Belgium and Flanders, which you all know is a quite specific country. Uh, coming to Estonia, I've looked at the official uh, Estonian uh, website somewhere at the bottom that uh, they call themselves as uh, Scandinavia with a twist. Well, you can say that uh, Belgium is completely twisted at this moment. Uh, that is an image of uh, one of the campus buildings uh, in uh, Mechelen. That's um, the white spot here uh, where I work. Uh, it's a small city of 82,000 inhabitants uh, between Antwerp, which is up north, and Brussels. That's where I live. So, um, again, at the bottom, uh, you can tell that perhaps living in Brussels uh, as a bilingually uh, educated uh, Belgian, I was raised in French and in Flemish. Um, now I work in Mechelen, uh, perhaps I can, s be, I can see myself as one of the last true Belgians uh, because you all know that there are some important uh, constitutional, cultural, political um, difficulties or um, uh, differences in, 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 in understanding and meaning between Flanders and uh, Wallonia. And Brussels is a kind of a bastard <laughs> um, situation in the center of it. But as you see, in terms of um, um, country, uh, Belgium is more or less uh, the same as uh, Estonia. Um, the difference, perhaps the most important, is that we are uh, 11 million inhabitants, and I think Estonia is like 1.4 million or something, which is uh, the actual amount of population living in Brussels only. But some important need-to-know facts about uh, Belgium. Um, I, I, I find it important to tell them because it has to do with uh, the reasons and uh, why we find it so important to uh, implement more entrepreneurial mindsets in uh, the heads of our students. Um, because it has to do with the, the, the social, political um, um, and cultural uh, situation. And I think Belgium, like a lot of European and especially old European uh, countries, um, have more or less the same problems. Um, if you look at this, this image, um, the, the, the Belgian wealth, Belgium's wealth, uh, was built from somewhere uh, in the pre-industrial period until mid of the 50s, thanks to uh, heavy industry uh, in Wallonia, especially, uh, where there were big plans for mining, for heavy metal industry, uh, coal mining, etc. So it was, it, it's a culture and a, and a sphere of uh, large-scale industrial economical uh, activities, uh, which we all know are now more and more disappearing. But starting from the 50s from now on, let's say, um, the, the Flemish community uh, started to rethink its uh, economical basis, let's say, um, and, and, and is now, I think, uh, with reason, 
um, uh, starting to be a, a smart region uh, where the politicians understood that um, well, heavy industry was already long time gone uh, in Flanders and so the own important industrial asset that Flanders has are our brains. Yeah? Um, so they, they started to, to change that and um, at this moment uh, the 85% of the, the gross regional product uh, of um, Flanders comes from uh, small and medium uh, enterprises of, of, of a lot of entrepreneurial activities that uh, take place. Um, but at the same time, Wallonia is, uh, is, is getting away from its uh, industrial past, but still on a political and, and social uh, domain, it is still uh, um, a, a, a by the socialist party dominated uh, caring society with, with a bottomless pit. And the bottomless pit has to do with money and power. That um, uh, has to do with, with this. Yeah, first of all, there was the, the switch in, in wealth, let's say. 930 euro, yeah? 930 euro is the exact amount that an economy professor calculated uh, of what an average Flemish family uh, pays as uh, solidarity money each year uh, and does as extra taxes. And that go directly to the, to, to the, the federal uh, treasury, let's say. Um, and that is um, extra money or solidarity money that also goes to the Walloon part of uh, the country. And of course, uh, if you want to, uh, to have people angry and let, let them vote for nationalistic parties, like uh, the chairman of the Flemish nationalistic party is uh, Bart Wever, who you see there, um, the best way to uh, make them angry is to attack them in their wallet, eh? is, to, is to tell them uh, keeping Belgium together means that for the rest of your life you will pay uh, extra and unnecessary tax money uh, towards uh, the Walloon part. So that makes governing Belgium very, very difficult. Uh, with the last federal uh, elections, it took more than a year to, f to form a new federal government, which is composed of Flemish and Walloon. Um, and that makes things uh, very difficult. Uh, at this moment, uh, the situation is, is thus polarized, uh, is, is thus difficult that, um, well, if, if, if possibility possible, I would come back for the 30th uh, anniversary of the Estonian Entrepreneurship um, um, University in 10 years, then there's a big chance that Belgium will not exist anymore uh, at that moment, that uh, the Flemish will call for independence, etc. Well, Belgium will probably still exist as a name, but then it will be only be Wallonia and Brussels, probably, or we'll see what the fight will bring, because Brussels is one third of the federal gross Product is created in Brussels. All the international institutions are there. All the European communities there, etc. So uh, it's it's difficult. Um, if if we put all these this uh, background information in a, in, a, in a questioning perspective, and and we um, we we put some uh, global entrepreneurship monitor facts uh, between of, uh, about entrepreneurship in Flanders, I've took some quotes. Uh, to give you an idea how entrepreneurship is conceived uh, within uh, the, the, the Flemish uh, community, let's say, uh, and especially amongst uh, students. Well, there's first and for all, 85% uh, of, of its richness comes from SMEs, so the high quality and innovative nature of new entrepreneurship in Flanders is a fact, but uh, due to the fact that there is still one difficult Belgian government uh, after you manage to survive uh, over-regulation to run or to start a business. Uh, it's, it's, um, uh, a lot of times young people are, um, are stopped to, to develop uh, their own business because they look towards a large, an enormous amount of paperwork and administrative work to actually start it. If you see in France, you can start your own business in three hours only using internet, you have your own business. Um, positive trends as regards societal perceptions of entrepreneurship, but these um, uh, perceptions are still very uh, persistent um, of the image of an entrepreneur being a profiteer, a black worker and a big car driver. You know, if you look at the highways in Flanders and you have the third lane, the fast lane, you see all big BMWs and Mercedeses, you can be sure it's an entrepreneur. Huh? Um, so this gives an, a wrong image to young people that being an entrepreneur is uh, having a big car and having a, B a BMW, etc. Uh, levels of opportunity, recognition, motivation, and entrepreneurial capacity 
remain at the bottom of the list in European, king, European rankings. There's a major perception problem. You know, it's, it's, it's not so very sexy and cool for young people to think about the idea of starting um, a own business. Some 30% of the system of civil service uh, is to be seen as hidden unemployment. Th this has to do with this caring society uh, aspect of, um, of the Walloon culture, let's say, that uh, if, if they have problems of unemployment, they create a lot of over-unemployment within the civil services. Uh, and then you have like services in small communities uh, where there's like 15 people working in, uh, in a service where you can do the job with three people, okay? Um, Flanders is at the top three with the lowest startup rates in Europe. This has to do with all this, uh, with this general image of perception. And for example, as an opportunity in the next 10 years, uh, we have our 85% of small and medium enterprises, but these people are all retiring and what is going to happen after their retirement? Uh, at this moment, we know that there are some 200,000 companies who are looking for uh, to, to be taken over. It's not always the son or the daughter or whatever who takes the company over. So um, in Mechner, for example, we see this very um, uh, concrete in the street image that there are certain streets where one after the other small and medium enterprises closes and then the shop closes, uh, there are no, there's no activities anymore, there's no people passing by, there's um, poverty coming in, etc., etc. So things are going relatively fine in Flanders, indeed. It's a very wealthy region. I think it's the fifth richest region uh, in Europe since there's so much wealth thanks to small-scale uh, entrepreneurship. Um, but on the other hand, uh, a 2010 survey amongst uh, 10 young pe 1,000 young people uh, about becoming an entrepreneur resulted in this. Uh, it has to do with uncertain income. Uh, it has to do uh, with the, well, perhaps the wrong idea. It's a way to become rich. It's not a way to become mentally rich, but to actually earn a lot of money and have that big BMW. Uh, it's better to work as an employee during a few years first, but in general we see that when people with intrinsic entrepreneurial capacities do this, that they continue doing it for the rest of their career and finish the entrepreneurial um, ambitions. ambitions. No experience, no bank loan, uh, unless you have a solid business plan. But then, of course, uh, you have to ask the question, who is able to present a business plan? Who is trained in making a business plan? Um, and that is, so far, most of it is only students from uh, business administration um, uh, courses. And that is, for example, one of the reasons that I do a plea for more interdisciplinary self-navigating uh, education so that uh, engineers and um, designers and uh, etc. can uh, start to learn to, to have a feeling of what making a business plan is. Lack of crucial skills, uh, uncertain pension, etc. Failure is a stigma, that's a very, very difficult one. Uh, if, we, if you know that um, failure is like something which is considered as being completely normal in the United States, for example, uh, there's even entrepreneurs who say that uh, if you didn't fail four or five times, don't be an entrepreneur because probably you will never become a good one. And failure is an enormous uh, stigma. It's, it's one of the biggest thresholds for young people to, to, to start up a business, already projecting the idea it could possibly fail. And at the same time, they're also aware of the fact that they are living in this very, very caring society, yeah, where uh, even if you're not an entrepreneur or you're employed with a company or in a civil service, things have to go really, really bad to, to end up in the gutter, for example, or become very poor because it's wealth in the, 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 the wealth in Belgium uh, is also thanks to this wide network of, of caring uh, instruments. So that's w about this perception. So in general, uh, if I again use a kind of an image to, to give, to give, uh, to give uh, uh, content on this, um, I think that a, a lot of young people in Flanders, if they project their future professional life or life in general, uh, I think I'm not wrong that they see it as being in a hammock forever, yeah? Uh, that life is something really sweet and, and um, if you know, for example, Belgium is the last country in the world where uh, after you have been working one day officially and uh, you, you, you become unemployed the day after, you can receive unemployment money for the rest of your life without ever working again. Uh, it's, it's, it's a complete um, misgrown situation. And the reason why it's there is because of the Walloon, the social, French socialist thing that this caring society must continue. On the other hand, the Flemish who are 
historically also more um, entrepreneurial. They, they believe that it has to go away, but if, if they're still in, in one federal government, then nothing happens and no so solutions come. So I think that it's wonderful to live in a country with so much wealth, but at the same time, it's the equally reversible reason why there are so many or, or so little startups. There is no or, or very few re necessity reasons for young people to become entrepreneurial. Yeah? Um, so this is why I think that entrepreneurial education, the idea of concept or entrepreneurial education and entrepreneurship are so important to embed in uh, a student's uh, mindset. So building this entrepreneurial university college and fostering uh, among young people is not that simple at all, but we try to do things. First of all, there's a policy plan, Vlaanderen in Actie, Flanders in Action. It's a kind of a pact with uh, the, the, the society for 2020. Uh, Flanders wants to be or excel as an economically innovative, sustainable and socially warm society and be in the top five of front runners again uh, in Europe by creating seven major breakthroughs and one of them is the open entrepreneur. So that's a good thing. Higher education, education and policy think the same um, um, things, let's say. Yeah? Uh, and if you look at what the politicians write about it, uh, we have to foster more entrepreneurial culture, uh, making Flemish enterprises more internationally competitive because, of course, our market is not only the Flemish market, it's, it's, it's whole the, the whole world. Uh, creating better frameworks for new and growing what we call the gazelle enterprises, where new industrial policy will create the factory or innovation, new innovation policy of the future, focusing on sustainability and new green economy. In other words, small is beautiful. So the future for new SMEs is bright eh, in, 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 in Flanders. Um, so, it's complementary ambitions between policy and higher education on the industrial and economical field. Uh, the learning Flemish, everyone, really everyone, employees, elderly target groups, women, must have the possibility to develop and deploy his, her talents uh, constantly, lifelong learning, by screening all educational levels where knowledge-based education shifts towards talent-based education. Yeah? Uh, that also hooks on, on my story of this morning, uh, where uh, classical uh, knowledge based from the teacher developed uh, education must take more attention to what actually people, students, elderly, etc. are passionate about um, to have a learning society in 2020. So we think that with practice enterprise, and now I'm coming to my story, uh, is one of the possible interesting instruments uh, to, to move towards that good direction. So uh, the, my, the, the, the title of my team was Practice Enterprise 2.0, but there was, of course, then a Practice Enterprise 1.0. Um, in fact, this was a very concrete research and development project, uh, which we did uh, for two years. And this was the image which I uh, promoted uh, the, the project, where the ice bear is the system of higher education, which is a, a, a gentle but sleeping giant. And we are the penguins uh, making some noise on his back to wake things up. And uh, the research, central research question was, how can edu higher education prepare students in the best possible way towards future professional life? You have to be aware that I work in a higher institution with only practice-based bachelor courses, not master or PhD courses. It's very, very practically oriented higher education courses. And the concept uh, of the, our, our, our solution came very quickly. Uh, let's try to copy 100% uh, real professional life in enduring education. Um, let's see what's happening in outside in the real professional world and just copy it during education. So we, we, we made a plea to move from, from this classical view and idea of what education is. <laughs> a teacher like me standing in a classroom with all people sitting in the back and transmitting knowledge and at the end of an academic year the knowledge come back, comes back in terms of an exam etc. No, we said let's find very literally an, 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 a model uh, in the outside professional world and, and let's try to organize education in this way. So it's a new learning concept developed in, in relation to educational and societal context and you see that already Confucius, uh, like uh, how many years, 3000 years ago or something, um, knew about this uh, by saying what I hear, uh, I forget, uh, what you're doing now, 
Uh, what I see, I remember. It's the way to, to capture uh, new knowledge uh, also by seeing it. But what I do, I understand. And, and that's what we're saying here. Practice Enterprise is an action-based doing uh, uh, concept of education. Where this educational context demands for complex and reality-based questions versus virtual, uh, not a teacher inventing uh, problems or questions and the students trying to give a solution on it. No, it's the real world that comes into the school and gives these uh, missions. Learning just in time versus just in case. Um, just in case has to do with the fact uh, you can follow a course uh, about uh, technology and perhaps in case sometimes later in your life you will need that information. I think it's possible to uh, create uh, a learning environment where you, 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 you get information or knowledge just in time, just at the moment that you need it to solve a, a kind of a problem. Uh, the ability to trans transfer new and not educational knowledge is really important and it's also quite logic. If you, if you put the outside world in the world of education, then you get new forms of, uh, of knowledge that are presented. Uh, it's not only the teacher um, as a knowledge transmitter doing it, it's, it's, it's everything. Yeah? Social constructivism, competence-based learning, and creating a powerful learning environment are other uh, educational contexts. But also societal contexts. Um, the dynamics of the labor market that is constantly changing. Um, career flexibility versus one life, one job. I think the, the, the period of having one life, one job is, is going to be over in, in about 10 years. So you, we, we, we need to train students to have this adaptability to change, to, to have 10 years one job and perhaps uh, 10 years after a completely other job. Uh, it will be normal. Uh, interdisciplinarity versus monodisciplinarity. Um, if you see the image here, it's, uh, it's, one, it's a very um, sad uh, social uh, 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 employment situation that just recently happened in Flanders. It's one of the last very, very big uh, uh, Ford plants from the Ford um, automotive companies who closed in Limburg. And from one day on the other, 4,500 people fell without jobs. I mean, the plant will be closed by the end of 2014, but these people already know now the job is finished. 4,500 4, people, you have to double that amount because there's a, a lot of other companies around it who deliver uh, parts and, and components of uh, the Ford company. So it's, it's a really huge social bloodbath, uh, a slaughter uh, that took place. But unfortunately, these guys, they, they only know one thing, that is uh, to, to, to make cars. Yeah? So they are, in a sense, very monodisciplinary in their professional skills, making cars. And unfortunately, there are no other big industrial um, production sites anymore in Belgium. Yeah? The only... Um, new industrial assets that Belgium and Flanders has, again, are brains. So you need to train already from, from education uh, young people to be uh, interdisciplinary. Call from entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial attitudes, from industrial economy to knowledge economy, etc. So these are some th um, important uh, issues. Now, uh, before making the concept of practice enterprise, uh, we, we wanted to get inspired ourselves. And here you see some examples of practice enterprise um, related concepts, like for example, in The Hague, uh, the technical engineers, they have like a workshop, uh, which is organized as a real shop, where external clients can step in. It's actually in the school and uh, where they can go towards the counter and say, okay, we have, uh, 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 some interesting uh, technological uh, idea or, or product that we want to develop, can we do this together with you? Um, for example, in Canada, um, within uh, Agence École Cégep, there is a real communications agency that is actually, it's, it's within the course of communications management uh, that actually makes all communication products of the school itself. So it's a kind of an in-house company that the school started up with students, with teachers, creating all brochures and flyers and websites, etc. Here in Holland, um, you can actually uh, implement the outside world in school, or you can, as a school, take over the, the real world. And here, it's um, uh, an in-house media platform where a group of students uh, takes over a part of the media platform of a local newspaper during the whole year. Um, 
this goes really far because uh, the, 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 the paper itself invested uh, the loan of one um, collaborator uh, from the, the company to actually be the teacher uh, while the students are um, working as an in-house media platform. Uh, here, Youth for Youth, uh, it's to illustrate that practice enterprise is possible in, in my opinion, in any kind of uh, course. Here it's social work where uh, students, while working at, uh, in school or, or following their course, uh, they are as a kind of um, a service company uh, towards uh, issues that deal with problems of young people in, um, in cities of, of Holland. And they work on complex and real questions, uh, not virtual questions. Uh, they have to find innovative solutions. They have to collaborate with all types of um, expertise and they learn to build uh, a network. Uh, here, uh, which will probably interest uh, my colleague from Finland, also in The Hague, um, there is uh, an internal restaurant, a facility uh, organization, um, who is run by students and teachers. Yeah? So the, the students not only um, have to show that they are good participants in a typical uh, restaurant environment, but they also have to run the restaurant themselves. Yeah? under the supervision of a teacher. One of my uh, best known practices uh, is also from Finland, uh, is a design factory from the Aalto Universität, University, where uh, students in their first master year can choose to uh, continue a big part of their uh, program in an interdisciplinary um, setting, uh, where technology, design and economy are joined together. Uh, it's really very, very powerful um, work setting. And if you s look at the mission of Design Factory, uh, it's uh, ab absolutely nothing to do with classical missions of uh, higher education. It's to, to have fun, to learn, and to work hard. So uh, after d doing one year of research and, and getting uh, a lot of inspiration, we defined uh, the definition. Uh, practice Enterprise is an organization or an enterprise within the lab of an educational institution or one program run by students and teachers, lecturers, run together, yeah? collective, collaborative, and functioning as an educational environment. Practice enterprise continues to exist. This is really important. Uh, this means, for example, um, in a design course at Thomas More, we have our practice enterprise called Design Office. Um, and these people, they develop new products, etc. So they make kind of a portfolio. Well, that portfolio, after they are graduated, still needs to continue to grow. And the second year students, um, now in June, for example, will be able to solicitate for a job in the practice enterprise and to take over the portfolio and the work of what the uh, former students did. So it's not attached to one group of students in a certain year, it's, it's an organization that continues to exist. Uh, independent of incoming and outgoing students. Practice Enterprise delivers real products and our services to its customers, not virtual project, real things. The only missions that they uh, accept come from uh, the external markets. Within the Practice Enterprise, students carry out all working processes typical for the professional context. And this makes it, um, this is like um, the, the moment where, where, where formal education and practice become very tactile because, of course, students working in a practice enterprise, like for example design, they still have their uh, course subjects like uh, sketching and autocuts and uh, designing itself, uh, but all typical technical skills that are needed to become a good designer. By um, having its practice enterprise, all non-technical skills join, like organizational skills, management skills, social skills, etc. The professional field is involved in an active way in the learning process. The educational institution has a final responsibility for the quality of the work and the quality of the education. So that's our definition. But to make this um, working, we developed a kind of an implementation scheme uh, where we have here other or classical form of practice learning and practice enterprise, and where we have six important domains. Uh, learning assignments, simple virtual or non-authentic, complex real and authentic, the competences, only technical knowledge versus organizational, social, and management, the inclusion in the curriculum, apart from subjects, related to few subjects, or integration of everything. Uh, of course, the more you go to the right towards a full practice enterprise, 
the more you are practice enterprise. Disciplinarity, there's a difference between mono, multi, and interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity means that you work together with completely other uh, domains than, for example, only design. The teacher role, very important one, very difficult one, as a only transmitter of knowledge or more like a coach, and the involvement of the professional fields. And with this scheme, take for example that you're a kind of uh, uh, course X, uh, certain course, you can actually find out for yourself where on a kind of an axis you find yourself in working with all these uh, top, uh, top uh, components. And then you can choose to actually uh, put this point, for example, there, uh, having the coach more, uh, or the teacher more as a coach, uh, having more or, or, or less uh, disciplinarity or not, etc. Of course, the basic or most important idea is to evolve towards as many as possible components of a practical or practice enterprise. So the most important educational effects are here. Uh, it's, it's about integration, the coordination, and being embedded in the curriculum. It's about the learning tasks, interdisciplinarity, the teacher as a coach, and the world of work as an educational partner, where learning in practice and as an enterprise take place at the same time. And so we have our own practice enterprises. I will quickly um, sketch them. Uh, first of all, there's SUPO, that is within the courts of journalism. And what the first them, for example, is that they actually work together with four different um, bachelor courses, uh, journalism, communication management, applied audiovisual communication, and ICT. Because what they do, the product that they make, is a multimedia news platform. And they create four types of media products. And we all, they all need this expertise to actually make this. Yeah. We have a communications agency called Pitch. It's a little bit uh, like um, Agence Ecole, uh, the, 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 the example I showed from, from Canada. It's a real communications agency. This is Design Office. It's a, a screenshot of their uh, website, which was built by the Design or Source students, which is the practice enterprise of multimedia design, etc. So you see where interdisciplinary collaboration starts. Um, this is Design of Source Self, where they uh, promote their clients, etc. Um, this is uh, a newly starting practice enterprise within business administration called Audion, but it's the learning environment of Audion. Audion at the basis is an expertise center run by uh, teachers, but where some task will be given to students working in Audion to support to give support to real business regarding business plan, finance plan, marketing, etc. So is it a successful concept? We think yes. What's the most important added values for students? They can and learn more. I will later explain you that um, students who operate in practice enterprise, uh, the quality of their competences uh, increases. Uh, they, they deliver better work than in the classical way. Uh, a really important one, it's, it's fun to operate in practice enterprise because uh, for the students it gives an image of uh, future real life instead of being again and again in the classroom. Yeah. So they are extremely motivated and their learning motivation increases. And they're better prepared for labor market. For the course, courses, it's a possible first step in interdisciplinary learning. It's a driver for change. Uh, teachers get inspired to see that um, um, the responsibility of, of learning something uh, using practice enterprise um, is, is of equal and even better quality than doing it in the classical way. And the civil society effect becomes concrete. I mean, it's a way for higher education institutions to step out of the closed territory that it often is. And civil society, the external world, can see what good work uh, students can deliver. But there's, of course, also some bottlenecks. Uh, it's not uh, shining everywhere. The proof of quality, uh, if you work with external clients, uh, and they often pay for it, for the work that you deliver, of course, you have to give a quality proof. Uh. Uh, in most cases, in 95%, clients are very satisfied with the work that they give. But the problem is uh, the relation of the teacher towards the fact that they have to let go loose and the fact that uh, a product of the institution is given in the hands of students. And often we hear from uh, teachers not wanting to participate in practice enterprise saying that, well, uh, it could happen that the, the, the quality of the work of the students is not good, so we will have to 
uh, make it better, and we are not prepared to do that. So that's a bottleneck. Uh, and, and the resources are using it, the sustainability of teachers' engagement, because it needs a different and more time engagement of uh, working with it, because you're working like in real life, uh, classical schooler, uh, time schedules, etc don't fit anymore. If a client says, Friday evening at 6 o'clock, I want your product, then we have a problem, knowing that most schools in Europe, Friday at 12 o'clock, everything closes. Uh, evaluation in relation to teamwork, because if you choose uh, an outside model of working in practice enterprise, um, like a design office, it's, uh, it's a team of several students uh, operating together. But who is finally the one who gave the bright idea of, of making a new product? And how do you evaluate that? Because at the end, Finally, we give them all their diploma. So we, we have to be very careful in, in working with evaluation and also the student profiles. Not every student is a practice enterprise student. There are indeed students who choose to follow the classical traditional courses. So um, perhaps you are already inspired in, in the concepts and we, we described 12 steps. Uh, get inspired or uh, by, by uh, listening, listening to my story, for example. You can also hire me <laughs> to, to help you to implement it. <laughs> Create support. You need a team of very enthusiastic teachers. Define entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial attitudes, which are different in tourism, in design, technology, etc. Define the role of the world of work as an educational partner. What do you actually ask from them and expect from them? Select a working model out of the world of work. Define the place and the scale and the connection in relation to the curriculum. Define operational conditions. That's an easy one. Uh, it's just saying, okay, uh, um, CEOs of the institution, we need that to start with practice enterprise, and then it's their responsibility to give you the money to actually do it. But just the most important one is just there to start. Um, but start with a small group to learn and, and to correct. Uh, it's not a good idea to say, okay, we'll start practice enterprise with a whole course of, uh, let's say, 250 students, that's too big. Yeah, you need a very small group to gradually and experimentally see what the impact of using practice enterprise in your course is. Define a system of observation in order to learn and correct. Evaluate practice enterprise wide and deep after every working year. Search for interdisciplinarity and optimize continuously. So after two years of control experiment, we collected some data. And these one, we really measured them. The quality of competences is higher. We made a comparison between students who are not trained via practice enterprise and others who did. And the quality of competences was sometimes 30% higher. And that is, I think, a very inspirational uh, thing because that's basically things that we want to, to, to give the possibility to students to excel. The world of work responds positive towards these different trained students. They see that they have more skills than just the technical ones. They see that they al already have social management, organizational skills, that they, are, um, they have a, a higher defensibility, uh, presenting themselves to, to the world of work. Learning motivation increases. That's for me a really important one because Thanks to democratization, nowadays in Flanders it's possible for everyone, every 18-year-old student, to start higher education, but uh, not everyone is, is, is ready to actually do that. And you see a lot of um, kind of tiredness, a uh, kind of laziness of people of 2021 saying in the third year, OK, one more year, and then finally I'll be graduated, finally I'll have the diploma, but one more year in the classroom, etc. And then you see that practice enterprise gives new uh, fuel, let's say, uh, to, 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 to continue work. This one is a very delicate one. Practice enterprise is cost reducing. It's quite obvious if you work not with one-on-one -on -one, uh, students, but in teams, you can achieve the same um, um, results with one teacher uh, working for a team instead of one teacher working one-on-one -on -one student. So it's relative cost reducing. And finally, Practice enterprise detects intrinsic entrepreneurship. That's also quite logical, I think, because uh, working and being trained in practice enterprise, it's a secure and controlled environment. It's still within school, but it is as real as in real life. And then students make kind of a click s saying, oh, this is being entrepreneurial. Uh, this is how you uh, start and, and, and roll a business. And so they get very much more um, uh, engaged and interested in starting an own business. 
So if we check the, the quality of practice enterprise uh, with reality, uh, recording to the um, OECD, entrepreneurial learning within education is or must be group-based, yes, interdisciplinary project work, yes, with a long duration in time, yes. Learning by doing, coupled with reflection, the learner takes own responsibility, that's self-navigation. Authentic, complex, interdisciplinary problems, cooperation between educational institutions and society, result valuable outside educational setting. So we think that it actually works. And if I put another very old quote by John Dewey, who was an American uh, pedagogist, uh, two, minim two more minutes, yeah. Uh, this is an image of practice enterprise for me. Uh, school is not preparation of life, it must be life itself, uh, by copying it um, in uh, education. So that was my story about practice enterprise 1.0, but what is then practice enterprise 2.0? Well, I think that's the next level, um, and it's, it's the institution itself that has to become a practice enterprise. Um, and it's, it's my new research and development track that I'm starting up now uh, by building an entrepreneurial university college, by implementing entrepreneurial mindset in all key processes of the institution, not only with curricula, uh, Campus Fridays, or with working methods, um, practice enterprise, but also with their researchers, with the teachers, with the management even, students, uh, even uh, the, the, the people who clean up the room, etc. I mean, everyone. Yeah. But again, you know that our institutions, uh, especially the big ones, are uh, slowly um, changeable uh, mammoth tankers, and uh, being a tugboat uh, can, um, can help to, to change the course of our mammoth tanks, but I think that you need a lot, a wide set of tugboats to, uh, or multiple course guides to actually change the course of, um, of, high, of, of, of institutional for higher education. And for that, what is needed, and that this is my, my basic uh, framework that I'm using now, um, strategy, resources, institutional framework, teaching and learning, outreach and development, key factors, senior leadership, a team of entrepreneurial champions. I mean, people or fools like me are <laughs> who are constantly um, engaged of, of, of trying to implement the importance of a more entrepreneurial um, mindset, sustained commitments, substantial financial resources. You need money for everything. Continuing innovation, organizational infrastructure, local, region, regional, and global partnership. And finally, um, Building the entrepreneurial university needs a mindset which is typical entrepreneurial. Uh, dare, uh, dreaming, daring, doing, and thinking. Uh, that's one of the, the three um, mindset topics that are often used to define entrepreneurship, to dream, to dare, to do, and especially to think uh, all, uh, also. And uh, finally, this, this person is Thomas More. And it's by coincidence that uh, I, I could use his image to actually have my last sentence here, I think it's important to reactivate Renaissance thinking. Um, because uh, what was strong, and I think if, if I had to choose uh, another name for our institution, I would have said Leonardo da Vinci a University College, because that was a Renaissance thinker. What is a Renaissance thinker? That's the T-shaped thinker. That's the specialized generalist. That's someone who is... Um, on, basis on, on, uh, on the basis of, of passion and talent, uh, has a lot of expertise in a certain domain, like Thomas More had, oops, oh. um, or, or Da Vinci, but at the same time was able to develop this profound expertise thanks to a lot of transversal uh, skills and, and, and the ability to hook on, on different uh, thinking um, frames that uh, he was, uh, he or his, 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 the people from his period were able to, uh, to develop actually the, the society where we're still I living in now. Yeah. Uh, I think that um, with the introduction of education as a system, as a structure, we lost a lot of, um, of this T-shaped thinking. And I think that um, by uh, creating some important small breakthroughs like Campus Fridays or, or, or Practice Enterprise, then uh, an amount of Renaissance thinking can, uh, can come back. And that's just two minutes over time. Thank you.